go. Welcome to episode 170 of Autobot Topic. What's up, Brad? Not much, Andrew. What's going on with you today? Oh, well, you're here in studio versus being I remote. Am. It is a holiday weekend. That's and right. I am back in the grand old state of Massachusetts to visit with family for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we did try to work on a couple of your cars that were here. Gross. Yeah. All gross. Um, Life is terrible. Cars are bad. Go listen to a podcast about music. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna. We're so close to the stereo. So I have this like wild, crazy ambition to just drive the stereo ugly and leave it here as my like. Don't need to get a rental car because when I fly home, I have this crappy old stereo to drive around. Right. Right. And that was that's a good plan because the car w- was. Even after sitting, it would start up every time. Yeah, the car sat for four years at one point, and I got in and put a battery in it, and it cranked over it, and I drove it out of its parking spot. Yeah, so I, I was totally approving of this plan. I was like, "Yep, this is a good idea." You, you got Arizona tags, right? So no in- mass inspection required for the rust. Yep, we were just gonna patch the holes in the floors, learn some welding on it, and ship it. Not ship it, drive it. Drive it. Leaving it here. Leave it here. Shipping it implies going back Send to it. Arizona. Yeah. Um. And then today, we went to pull it out of your parking spot. No start. No start. Nothing. No start. So we did crank all... Crank and crank and crank. Like, okay. Yeah. So pull the coil lead off. Has spark. Has spark. Spark is good. Uh, pull the fuel line going off into the throttle body. No fuel. No fuel. Hmm. Okay. Maybe the ethanol and the fuel gelled up and got weird and it's even though filter we drove the car like a month ago from spot to spot it also got really cold recently so and it also had almost no fuel in it yeah so we put five gallons of fuel in it yeah uh no fuel coming out of it okay undo it at the we couldn't really hear the pump going on but we're like "Mm, maybe maybe let's check one more thing first so you pulled the line off the fuel filter. There's fil- fuel in the bottom of the filter or in right. the filter. In the filter, it's, yeah. It's like on the frame rail on the passenger side. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go grab the power probe. So quick before we get to that, yeah. the power probe was to test the fuel pump. Yeah. Um, we couldn't hear the fuel pump, but the way the Starion is wired, yeah. the fuel pump doesn't isn't triggered by the ignition being on. No. It's triggered by the tachometer. Yeah. So, so when it sees revs, the fuel pump kicks on. So generally, a styrene that's been sitting for a while doesn't start in the first crank. Yeah. Because it uses that crank to push the fuel from the filter, sorry, from the pump up to the filter mm-hmm. into the ejectors. So we figured maybe if it had all evaporated in the lines, it wasn't pumping oh, it right. up enough and we didn't know, we couldn't hear it because... The tack wire wasn't sending a signal to the pump. I'm like, we we'll try to figure this out. We got the car to run an ether. We thought maybe it would start pumping. Right. Because it was running. Right. No. Didn't work. Uh, so I grabbed the power probe, checked it. Um, it had, once we I grounded the plug for the pump and then applied power to it. Like a full 12 volts right to the pump. Yep. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. It should, should have heard it go. Wee! There's no reason for nope. it not to work at that point. So it fuel pump. Needs fuel. Just needs fuel pump. Ran when parked. Yep. Just needs fuel pump. No low balls. I know what I got. Um, oh, man. So random. Like, the car literally started up. You parked it. Left it. Literally. From... Literally ran while parked. Needs fuel pump. All I need now is to take a picture of it with my thumb in front of the plate, and I have a Craigslist, you know, triad. So. Yeah. I'm trying to think. It was May? You parked it in May? No. When was the last time you had it out to put the nose on it? Um, we had it out last time I was home. I thought it was before you moved. No, but last time I was home on the move, I had it moved it just to move it. So it was maybe a month ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Weird. I started it when I was home for Radwood, Boston. Oh. Because we were going to try to slam it together then, remember? Oh, weird. Yeah, so literally a month the ago. The pump ran. just died. Yeah. So the other thing, too, is locally, we were just going to get a basic inline fuel pump for a fuel injected car right that does not exist in stock locally anywhere apparently no uh it's only low pressure ones for like carbs or like fuel transfer right um 
What are you doing? Sorry, I'm trying to tell you your volume is too high. Oh, my volume You're is too high? You're literally blowing up my eardrums and speakers. Oh, well, you... There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, That's where that is. Uh, So, it was like... Yeah, that's like a weird thing that... But then you were like, but it's a really simple part. But then I had to remind you that the this Starian is a weird in-between carbs and fuel injection mm-hmm. where it could have been a carbureted engine, but they put a throttle body on it. And then the fuel system was like adapted from like carburetors because it's an external electronic fuel pump. It's a TBI. Yeah. So it's a similar set. It's like, it's basically an electronically controlled carburetor when you come down to it. So it's throttle body injection versus having multi-port injection. Yeah. So it is a, it is a holdover. That 2.6 was designed with carburetors. That basic car is a Sapporo before a Sapporo Galant Lambda Challenger, whatever. Um, and it's the it's only the second year of the car, right? So it's really early on in the technology of fuel injection from Mitsubishi. So it is weird. But my problem is that's a universal fuel pump. It's not specific to 1984 Starians. No, it's specific to any car that has an external fuel pump for with fuel injection. Yeah, which left on the road is next to nothing. But still, I think there should be enough that it would be maybe something not, in stock at maybe not a Pep Boys. He, maybe not here, out where they didn't rot away. I bet in Phoenix you could find one of these really easily. Maybe. But here, not so much. I'm going to do that when I get home. I'm going to try to buy one just to see if I can get one. See if you can get one locally. I'll because just stop at an app and be like, hey, do you have this in stock? That was the other thing, too. You looked it up online. It was like a $30, $40 pump. Yeah. And everywhere they're like, we can order it, but it's $180. And we're like, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I expect to pay a little bit more walking into a store than ordering from Amazon Maybe or Rock $60. Auto. $60. And even that would be, I thought, high, but yeah. I was willing to pay it. But $180 is like 500% markup. Yeah. That was a lot of money. I mean, really, I know I know. we're like being real like, whoa, that's a lot of money to spend on this $800 Starion. It's but, like a $200 Starion by this point. The car is trash. Yeah. The only people who would put a dime into this car are you and I. Yeah. So. That's why it was like, ah, man, knowing that you can get a $40 fuel pump if you just wait a couple of days. Yeah. It's worth. The problem is we don't have a couple of days because I'm literally getting back on an airplane and flying home in two days. Well, and the day in between today and that day is a holiday. So yeah, at least we diagnosed it, so you know what it is for the next time you're out here. So I ordered one on Amazon. Yeah. So it'll be here on Friday. Okay. If I if I'm ambitious enough Friday morning, which I probably won't be because I have plans, um, I'll throw it in, but I won't. So. Tis what it is. Yeah. Um, bummer, but it's super annoying. That's all I can say about it. It's it's really bums me out. I think what bums me out more about anything else when you talk about the hundred and eighty dollars that I don't want to spend on this yeah. shitty old car. I literally spent a hundred and seventy dollars on it yesterday, registering it and plating it and titling it mm-hmm. in Phoenix, Arizona. Because last time I was here, it ran. I know. And it's it's not that far off. And the only reason why I want to keep it around, and I encourage you to keep it around, is just it's a really good car to practice welding on. It's a great car to practice body work. Yeah. It's also a great car to just have and do stupid things with. Yeah. We, could, we could do a drift day. We could do an autocross. We can do a rally cross. Yeah. We can do a road rally. We can do all those fun events in this dumb, beat-up car and not really care that much about it. Yeah, exactly. But care enough. I mean, not... not not care about it to like trash it on purpose, but not worry about it as much. So we can't do those fun things with it. Mm-hmm. I just want to have the car spinning tires and sideways somewhere soon. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, it will not be this weekend. Nope. The plan, all ye listeners, was to wake up Friday morning and go to a big abandoned parking lot somewhere and just take burnout pictures. <laughs> yeah. But it's not going to happen now. Need fuel to do burnouts. Mm-hmm. So unless you want to stand next to the car and spray ether into the intake while I'm doing burnouts, <laughs> might be a pretty good picture. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's not uh, not going to happen. Oh well. Yeah. Bummer. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, I saw Ford versus Ferrari last Sunday. I saw Ford versus Ferrari as well last Saturday. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what'd you think? The title is a little misleading. Yes. Um, there is an element of Ford versus Ferrari. Mm-hmm. 
but it's not enough of an element to name the movie Ford vs. Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more um it's a more a story about Carol Shelby and Ken Miles. Exactly. Than it is anything else. What else would you call it though? Uh Le Mans sixty six. Yeah. Ford at Le Mans. Ford America takes Le Mans. Well, I know the Adam Carolla documentary was Go Like Hell. Okay. Which, that would have been a good movie title too, but they already took it, so it would and it wouldn't because it predates the Go Like Hell Carol Shelby stuff. They used it in this movie though. Did they? I didn't even know, didn't even notice. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a couple others. There's like Ford. There's there's two other documentaries on Netflix and Amazon Prime. This is the 24 Hour War. Yeah, and one's called Ford something. Oh, sorry, sorry. The Adam Carolla documentary is the 24 Hour War. Okay. So there's one called Go based Like Hell. Based on the there's a book. I think it's based on the book Go Like Hell. Okay. Which um, probably goes more into the 80s Shelby stuff. I don't know. It's no, no, no. That the Go Like Hell is from apparently the lore of him of Carol Shelby writing it on the pit board to Ken Miles. At least that's the way they portray it in this movie. You're right. I did, I did notice that. Now yeah. You said it. Yeah. I, I forgot that part. Yeah. But because obviously Shelby in the '80s did all the Dodges and they're all GLHs. Yeah. Wish it for Goes Like Hell. Yep. Or Go Like Hell. Goes Like Hell. Yeah. So anyway, which I thought that was an interesting fact in the movie because. It shows an interesting dynamic between Lee Iacocca, mm-hmm. who worked for Ford at the time, yep, and Carol Shelby, who worked for himself at the time. Mm-hmm. And then when Iacocca left Ford, he went to famously went to Chrysler and saved air quotes Chrysler from bankruptcy mm-hmm. by creating the K car and the minivan. And he brought Shelby along to tune the K car with the Shelby GLHs. So that was kind of cool. I didn't realize that Iacocca had as big of a part in. The Ford Lamar project, if if the movie's as accurate as portrayed, I think you did, yeah. Um, actually, I noticed that the Twenty Four Hour War is on Amazon Prime now, so and I'll there's, to check there's, it out. And there's another one on Netflix about about the cars too. Uh, Hold on. One well, there's a uh, one on there's another one on Amazon Prime too that is uh, Shelby America. Okay. Uh, and I remember reading I had a Shelby American book that I had when I was like middle school reading it so when we're watching the movie i started to remember stuff i was like oh yeah that's right that's that's like why i I like really like southern california because all this stuff happened there right all this really cool sports car stuff happened there and like they don't really it was cool i guess the thing i liked about the movie is they made it in a way that i felt was appealing to a mass audience without over explaining every detail so on Netflix right now, sorry to interrupt you, is the 24 Hour War. Mm-hmm. It's on Netflix and Shelby American. Yeah, those are both on uh, Netflix right now. Oh, they're also on Amazon Prime. I noticed. Okay. So, um, the yeah, like what they did, you know, if you're a car person, you know that Carol Shelby had a car condition, and that's why he stopped racing. Mm-hmm. But how do you explain that to an audience that's just going into the this movie that might not know that? So they did this really cool thing where he was racing at Le Mans in 55, and then... Was it that early? Yeah. Isn't 55 the year the Mercedes crashed, too? Yeah, yeah, it was. Or was yeah. 55 or 54 or something, Or but he won overall. Okay. Um, And they show him kind of like, towards the end, like getting kind of tired and stuff. And then that, you know, it flashes to a doctor and then like telling him he can't race mm-hmm. anymore. So that was kind of a, a neat way to like show that. Um, but you're right. It wasn't about so much Ford versus Ferrari. It was about Ken Miles and Carol Shelby just going racing yeah, and just doing. It was more about how Shelby really became synonymous with Fords and fast Fords than it was about. Yeah. And, and just it was more important for those two to just go racing. They didn't really care. Right. It didn't matter who they were going to beat. They just wanted to go racing. So uh, what I thought was interesting is I did go and see it with Naomi, who did not know the whole story as well as you or I do because, yeah. you know, she didn't grow up reading Carol Shelby books. Yeah. So it was neat to see it with her because as a just a regular moviegoer, not knowing how the movie ended, 
she yeah. was taken the whole time by the drama of the movie and how they put the movie together. And mm-hmm. like, she didn't not know that the three cars crossed the finish line together. She didn't know that they won that year. She didn't know that Ken Miles passes away in a, you know, a testing accident. All the stuff that we take as jaded car enthusiasts, and like, you know, he starts testing the car after Lamar. I'm like, this is where Ken Miles dies. This is not gonna be cool. Yeah, his son's there watching. Super sad. Yeah, and then like, um, you know, it was kind of they like skipped. They didn't lay out a timeline, which was good too. They hinted at it. Yeah, they like here's the launch of the Mustang, which yeah. is sixty four. Yep. So then, like mid sixty four, and then and they were when they were actually doing the race, they had pins on their jackets that said sixty six. Yeah. So they were a little like, they were hints of what was going on, but not an exact timeline. Um, and then you know, famously, uh, I like how they were like, "Oh, Ferraris broke. We can just go buy them." Mm-hmm. Which really happened. It did really happen. And Fiat really bought them, and Fiat to this day owns Ferrari. Mm-hmm. So that was obviously a good purchase on their part. Yeah. Um, and, and Fiat did, like in the movie, they gave Ferrari total control of the company. They said, we just want to own the name. Mm-hmm. That's it. You own the company. Yeah. Here's some money. Have a nice day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a pretty good portrayal of it. I would put it up there, as far as racing movies go, in my opinion, it's second only to Grand Prix mm-hmm. as racing movies. Um, as a movie, it's better than Grand Prix. Uh, Grand Prix is a pretty good movie, actually. I think that the full, if you factor in every part of the movie and the plot line, I think there's more to. Yeah, it's probably more exciting. Uh, but Grand Grand Prix is a pretty darn good movie, actually, for a, a oh, 60s listen, movie. I, it, I enjoy the movie tremendously. I mean, it's a long yeah. movie. It's f- almost four hours. I'm just saying, take somebody who's not a diehard in the wool car enthusiast and put them in front of Grand Prix or Ford versus Ferrari, Ferrari and they're gonna enjoy Ford versus Ferrari more. I think. Yeah, I mean, maybe you should go back and watch Grand Prix, though. I think it has a lot of story in it. It has a very similar story with a racing driver looking yeah. for a ride, and, um, you know, it just doesn't have, like... Like confusing with Le Mans, maybe? Le Mans is not a very good movie. Yeah. It's a good, well, shot movie, but it's, a good movie. It's a pretty movie, yeah. but there's um, there's no talking for, like, the first hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, like, ridiculous. I love it, though. It is in. It's but cool to look that's, at. That's a straight car guy service, though. That's not a. Yeah, it wasn't cinematic masterpiece by any means. Yeah, it was. Uh, I have a check from the the uh, movie company here. I'm gonna yeah. go race in the Lama, race. Yeah. but they won't actually let me race at the Lama, so I'm gonna make a movie about it. Yeah. Either way. So yeah, I think it's really up there. And then there was only a couple weird things to me. Are we going to talk about, like, inconsistencies in the story or, like, period correct parts or... I don't mind. Nothing really pulled me out of it too much. It was interesting. One thing I noticed that was really obvious to me was brake fade. Mm -hmm. So, you and I know what brake fade is. Of course. Average car person knows what brake fade is. I don't don't think an average car person does. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. The average person does not know. The moviegoer doesn't know. Right. Um... When you're on a racetrack, if you're watching car, like especially endurance racing at night or any type of racing at night, and the cars hit the brakes, they'll glow orange mm-hmm. because you're just going that as fast. a normal function. As a of normal the thing, that's just the way they work. But in the movie, a way they showed brake fade was to all of a sudden have the brakes glow orange. Yep. And I was like, I was watching the movie. I was like, ah, that's not. Oh wait, I know why they did it. They I did, did it to make it obvious that brake fade is caused by heat. Yeah. yeah. And it helps you understand what they're talking about. So they're not just saying brake fade, and you're like, what the hell are they talking about? So now the average non-car person that watches the movie thinks brake fade is when your brakes turn orange and stop working. Technically, that's, yeah. I, I mean, mean it, it's a it's not true, obviously, because a car guy knows that brake yeah. fade is from the you know fluid boiling and there being air pockets in the brakes. But um, an average moviegoer now has heard the word brake fade yeah. and thinks it means, I mean, I guess, at the end of the day, it means too hot. Mm-hmm. So brake fade is caused by heat. So yes, yeah. it's kind of true enough. Um, there were a couple of visual things that took me out, and I was I went into this movie, yeah, and I said I'm not going to get angry about a car in the background that's off by a year or two. I'm not going to get angry about the tires on the race cars because I heard going into the movie that they had on some of the street cars they had like modern all seasons. Um, I didn't notice that in the movie. 
It was shot far enough away that you didn't see the tires. The, the still shots that were picked apart in the beginning, you could see in, yeah. the, in like the previews or the those parts weren't even in the movie. Wasn't even in the movie, so you don't notice that in the movie at all. Um, there were a couple of period era correct things that were era incorrect things that stood out to me. Um, I think the biggest one that a lot of people probably did notice was in the scenes in the garage when they're at the the airplane hangar. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a lot of Cobras and GT40s and Cobra Coupes, yep. which obviously in real you know real time 2019, those are very expensive, very rare cars. Yeah, and there are kits made of all of them. Yep. Um, the Cobra Daytona Coupes that were on the transporter in the background had like 18 inch wheels. Yeah, which was like visually, I'm like, Argh. all right, I'll let it slide. In the background, yeah, they're purposely put far away. I'm not gonna get angry about it. It's obvious to me, anybody who knows these cars, but I'll let it slide. I think the only thing that actually I actually put any thought into was when they were in Henry Ford the Second's office. Yeah, and he has all these shelves of model cars. Yeah, but they're all modern 118 scale diecasts. Oh, yeah. which did not exist at that time, and I think that bothered me even more because that was something that could have been. Easily rectified by not putting something modern there. Mm-hmm. And maybe nobody else noticed, or maybe only a diecast nerd like me who recognized half of the diecast on the shelf and yeah. knew what manufacturer they were. I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty low, yep. I'm pretty low on the average moviegoer who would catch that. Yeah. Um, but it bothered me. So those are the only real things that bothered me. There were, there were other things that made it, you know, you can only do so much as far as filming a movie in, peri- in period piece in 2019. But... Those are the things I noticed the most. So, no, I mean it was pretty cool. I it was very well done. If that's all I noticed, that's pretty good. I mean, there was never an obvious modern car. Honestly, in the and or... honestly, I wasn't worried about. It. I know some people didn't think that Matt Damon looked enough like Carroll Shelby. That's oh, fine. I, I thought he did a great job. Tell me what Carroll Shelby looked like in 1965. He resembled. They made. Yeah. It. It's... He was a round-faced guy who wore a cowboy hat. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. Worked with a I southern agree. draw, they made I it agree. work. So I, I have that that problem with every movie. It doesn't but, matter what movie you watch. If it's a famous person playing a famous person, yeah, it's gonna be hard to do. Like there's there's a um, Mr. Rogers movie in the theaters right now. It's played by Tom Hanks. Yeah, they made him out to look like Mr. Rogers. Yeah, but you can definitely tell it's Tom Hanks talking to you on the screen. It's not it's you clearly not Hanks. Fred Rogers. Yeah, right. That's what I mean. You can't do that unless you hire a completely unknown actor to do it. Yeah. You're, there's, there's no way to do it. Well, or we're spoiled by people like Christian Bale, who like to transform themselves to look like the person they're playing. I mean, even like it loses like a hundred pounds to play, play a role. Yeah, I mean, looking at him in uh, Vice, and then now looking at him in this movie. Oh no! I think the biggest stark difference with Christian Bale is the difference between Vice and the Machinist. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> and this movie somewhere in between. But yeah. he really, when you look at side by side photos of him, he looked like. He resembled he Ken resembled Miles. He resembled close enough. And honestly, so did Matt Damon. Yeah. Like, and li- close enough. And then, like, so much so he had, like, he would walk, he walked around with a little hunch to him. And, mm-hmm. like, it was like, man, that's just weird. I mean, and I have no idea what Henry Ford II looked like. Nope. Or what Lee Iacocca looked like at Not, that time. Yeah, at that time, yeah. But again, Lee, uh, the, the guy who played Lee Iacocca is a famous enough actor, too, is John Bernthal. Like, I've seen him in a half a dozen He's things. the Punisher. Yeah, he's the <laughs> Punisher, exactly. He was in. Uh, the early seasons of The Walking Dead. Like, yeah. He's not an unknown actor. And he was playing Lee Iacocca. I was excited because I like him as an actor. It was yeah. cool that he was in the movie. And then to see that he's playing like this I- icon of American car history was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And I hope that maybe that turns into there's more movies about American car history and he can play Lee Iacocca again because he did a pretty good job. Oh, yeah. And the guy, they just got old Italian guy to wear Ray-Bans. Yeah. And that <laughs> was... And so Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he may have to be a complete dick. <laughs> which he was. Which I've heard is probably pretty true. But yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people in that movie that were... Uh, the characters were either tremendously likable or tremendously unlikable. There wasn't anybody in the middle of that movie, I don't think. No. I will say, going to a couple things that did bother me again, not visually, but that I don't think would have happened that way. Um, it was a funny idea to have... Carol Shelby take the lug nut and throw it on the ground. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're There's like, a... they come back in. It's like it's got to come back in because you're using a lug nut. But the car has center lock wheels. That's what I was like. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. car has center lock wheels. It doesn't yeah. work that way. It doesn't work that way. And then you're not like the Italian team. Like they're not idiots. Yeah. Like 
right? Like you can't just like throw a spinner back down on the ground and be like, you forgot one of the center locks. Like what's going to happen here? Yeah, and then like so that was a little bit weird. Um, he like stole the stopwatches from the Italian. Well, team. that might happen. Maybe I, mean, I can't. I can't confirm nor deny that happened, but I can confirm that the Ferrari P1 race car, a 330 P1, or whatever race car that was. Um, does not have five lug wheels. It has a one big center lock to put yeah, the wheel on. Yeah. So that was kind of a somebody who made this movie doesn't know what they're talking about moment. Yeah. But I was surprised it got through as far as it did because something like that is a pretty egregious mistake. It's just like a goofy thing thrown into a little comic relief. Yeah, but they could have done something else, something that's more realistic. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Maybe you have like, I don't even know what. But it couldn't be a lug nut because cars clearly don't have lug nuts. No, that that so that that was one thing I did notice. Um, another thing that's pretty obvious is, and this is every Hollywood movie about cars ever made, is that when you want to win the race, that's when you push the gas pedal all the way down. You know, the thing is though, sometimes in endurance racing, you do actually kind of not halfway, run a little not slower, not halfway down the Mulsanne Street. You might you, you, okay. You might have a little bit it. of play in the in the throttle, but you, you don't drafting. Have, you don't have half half of the motion of the throttle pedal left. Slingshot engaged. Yeah, exactly what happened in the movie. I didn't notice as much of like the Fast and the Furious eighteen speed shifting. No, 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 no. Um, but there was the oh, we're battling. I'm real close to him. Coming out of the turn, foot to the floor, right behind him, foot through the floor onto the pavement to put the gas pedal down further to go faster. So that was that was one thing that I kind of, uh, but I noticed that that's every Hollywood movie every time I expect that. Yeah, that's how you win races. You you just drive side by side at half throttle, and then when there's like a hundred feet left, you just push the gas pedal the rest of the way down and win the race. Yeah, but that's again that's Hollywood. It is to be expected. Uh, what else? Anything else bothered me during the race scenes? Oh, the talking to each other in the first race scene when they're at uh, is it Willow Springs. Yeah. When they're talking to each other from side to side from car to car? Uh, I mean, no. you, you could yell. No, no. Yeah. Have you ever been next to one of those early 60s big block race car Corvettes? No. Uh, I don't know. Absolutely. 100% no. I could no. see it. You could turn to somebody and yell something, but there's no way that that person's going to hear you and respond with something in kind because it's not going to happen. This car is so loud. So loud. And that actually, what I thought was neat too, which I picked up on, um, the Corvette driven by, the Ponderant driving the Corvette? The blue Corvette? Yeah, one of them. So that was an actual famous race car. Yeah. Um, I actually have a die cast of that 60s Corvette, the same baby blue with the dark blue mm-hmm. um, meatballs with numbers in them. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. I think that was one of the early, early Z06 cars. That was a big thing. That was a big deal. They were... Those early Corvettes were battling it with the Cobras. Yeah, for sure. In a, that's the other cool thing of that time period where you could start as an amateur driver and work your way up through SCCA. Yeah. And potentially go to Le Mans if you're good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, yeah, you could start in a class with your MG Midget. It's possible today. It's highly unlikely. Incredibly difficult. Yeah. But uh, it seemed a little bit easier back then. Maybe a, maybe not, but it's... Maybe not when you were there. It, yeah, it... <laughs> It seemed like you had more of a chance. Well, at the time, there was a lot more um, like shade tree mechanic race car drivers. Exactly. Because you could do it. There wasn't a lot of technology wasn't so far advanced that you couldn't build a competitive race car in your backyard. Now, the other thing, I couldn't remember. Cobras were congruent with the GT40 program. Cobras were pre-GT40. Cobra no, no, sorry. In... Sorry, Cobra Coupes. They were relatedly unrelated. I thought they had obviously they, they he started with the AC coupe or the AC Cobra. No, sorry, the AC what was it called? It was a Cobra. It was, it was an AC Ace. AC Ace, right? And they turned him into Cobras. Yeah, because he started with that after what being inspired by Sunbeam, I think, if I remember right. Sure. Or, or it had something to do yeah, with Sunbeam. Sunbeam Tigers. And and like in the movie, he said you had to he had to rework them. Suspension is different than the mm-hmm. AC. And they had 289s in them, which I think a 289 Cobra is an attractive car. Oh, it's a great car. A really pretty looking car. Because it's that tri- typical standard, like, skinny English roadster mm-hmm. with a small block Ford in it. Yeah. Uh, and then a Cobra is still an attractive car, too. Just oh, for sure. They're just There's so many kit cars out there. Yeah. That you see, I, I don't even blink an eye if I see a Cobra go by anymore. Yeah. 
Like a 427 Cobra. Um, so, yeah. And then I thought the issue with the Cobra convertible, the Roadster, was that it did not have the arrow For to catch long straights. the Ferraris. Yeah. And that's where they came up with the Daytona Coupe. So I think... <sighs> and that's where... That was a Pete Brock design, I believe. So I'm going to have to go out on a limb and say I don't know for a fact, but what my understanding always was, and this is complete, like, from how I have learned this over the years, I could be wrong, was that Co- Shelby was already working with the Cobra Coupes. Yeah. Um, and then Ford wanted a car done faster than the Cobra Coupes could be competitive. Yeah. And they so they bought an already existing chassis. Ford, did, Ford and Shelby didn't design the GT40. No, and they explained that very briefly that this person from England had designed the chassis. It was, it was they were Lola race cars. Yeah. So they were already done. That first design was already done, mm-hmm. and they just slapped a Ford motor in it. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, that's the other thing. They didn't explain that, like, they didn't build this car from the ground up. Right. And what else did they do? They went from... Um, they kind of skipped from his shop, like it was down on like Venice Beach or something, um, and then they jumped to the shop they had at the airport, and like Carol Shelby won Le Mans Fifty Nine, by the way. Okay. Um, so he had like at the same time he was also building GT three fifty Mustangs. Um, they mm-hmm. were doing a ton of stuff. Oh, that was the other thing about the movie. Uh, you had this movie set in mid '60s Southern California, mm-hmm. and they used a couple like current songs that like sounded older. I had a problem with that. Yeah, I was just wish they just grabbed like just grabbed a couple authentic songs from the '60s. I mean, there was with a couple... Jan and Dean like "Hey Little Cobra." Like, what no, you no, 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 no. Like, uh, I don't know, just something evocative of the like, like how. Um, once upon a time in Hollywood used sixties music. Yep. Just something like that. I, I think for this movie it worked because it did. It wasn't super important, but it was a little right. thing that I, I would have liked to have seen added. I didn't even notice to be honest with you. I yeah. But you're I, bigger into that whole thing than I am. So Um I'm I'm gonna watch this movie again. I'll probably notice it then, but Oh definitely. Definitely I would I would watch it again uh, when it's true. So it looks like the Cobra Coop competed in sixty four and sixty five in Le Mans. Mm-hmm. And then the GT40 would have been also 65, wasn't it? They didn't win in 65, and they won in 66. Yep. So, yeah, it must have been congruent. I don't know what the reasoning there was. Different classes. Uh, and then the crazy thing, too, was, uh, you know, he, they also gave the car, they, like, briefly explained that they had given the car to other teams, like NASCAR teams, to run, because that was a common thing. Some teams yeah. would run. I didn't realize that that was done... And again, this is—I don't know how much of this is the movie and how much of it's true. I didn't realize that they were giving the cars to other teams to beat Shelby at that point, or yeah. if he was encouraged to beat Shelby at that point because Shelby was an outsider at that point. It just generates competition. It's right. like a way to get. I to did. A, I did know that the Holman Moody car was a Holman Moody car. I just didn't know what the significance of that was. It's just to get probably to an end goal quicker if you just give people competition yeah of course right um but then you know my big thing too is that really ford and ferrari ended up being the big losers here anyways because ferrari never won overall again mm-hmm. ford didn't win has never won overall again they've had a class win mm-hmm. in the new gt40 but after this it was pretty much porsche and the other german teams audi basically have dominated for the last 40 years of Le Mans, and now you're finally getting, you know, with the occasional, like, you know, Mazda won what, in the 90s once. Right. And then finally Toyota's won, the other only other Japanese manufacturer. So, you know, really it was like, ooh, big whoop, you know. So the Cobra Daytona Coupe did a class win at Le Mans in 65. Yeah. With, um, I think, Mondurant. But it was like, you know, interesting thing about this movie is that they actually got you to care about Gurney and Bondurant, one of the largest companies in the world. Right. It wasn't like Ford was almost like the little guy. 
even though they were not the little guy. They were guy. not the little they guy. They were the opposite of the little guy. Yeah. You know, Ferrari's building all these boutique cars, but it, like, didn't... It doesn't matter. Right. Like... <laughs> well, they, they... they I they think they tried to quell that a little bit in the movie. Yeah. By the beginning of the movie with that whole scene where he's yelling at them in the in the Ford Falcon factory. Yeah. Which I thought was really neat, too. I don't know if that was CGI'd or if they just found a bunch of Falcon bodies to disassemble and paint the same color. Yeah, I don't know. It was a really cool scene because they had this whole... Or maybe that's a display at a Ford museum somewhere. I don't know. But it was really neat how they had this, like, um, 63... Falcon assembly line or 64 Falcon assembly line. But I like how they also showed that Henry Ford II was probably also an asshole. <laughs> it wasn't just Ferrari. <laughs> well, what it was, it was two old boys club kind of guys, like, and their egos were hurt. Yeah. You know, Ford shot what Ferrari thought was an insulting offer. Yeah. And then Ferrari, then before insulted Ford. And it's like, he was kind of like, whatever, 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 until he said, what was what he said that made him go over the edge? Um, and you're like a you're just like fat or something. I don't even remember. Oh no, he said you're 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 Henry Ford the second. Oh, you're right. not Henry Ford. Yeah, and he was like, "That's it, f this guy." Open blank checkbook. Yeah. It's so just like, okay. Well, yeah, it's just that's the whole. <coughs> excuse me the uh, the fragile male ego, is, yeah. as people would say, and that's what they portrayed in the movie. So I don't know. I that's think really what it was. Listen, I think overall. For a car movie being made, you're not going to get much better. You'll definitely get worse, but you're not going to get much better. You'll get much worse. Yeah. That was excellent. For every Fast and the Furious, for every remake of Gone in 60 Seconds, for every, I don't know, again, for every Driven, <laughs> there's, yeah. there's maybe one movie like this. So I'll take it. I'll definitely watch it again. I'd like to go with my dad, actually, if I can get him to go before it's out of theaters. Yeah, I liked... um. The other movie I liked was Rush too. That was not Rush two. The sequel Rush was as Rush well. as well. Yeah, um, I still haven't seen it. That was. Yeah. I've heard that movie compared to this movie a lot because they're both modern interpretations of. Yeah, it was pretty fun though. Racing. I still have not seen that movie yet. Yeah, and there's a very funny part in that movie when. Um, oh my gosh, what's his name? He almost died in the fire on the Nuremberg Ring. He died recently. He was all burned. Oh my god. Oh. Yeah. Um, why, why am I being so dumb and blank on his name? Um, Durr. Yeah, this is bothering me now, too. Oh, no. This is terrible. Uh, oh, no. Uh, Nikki something? Well, Nikki Lada. Nikki Lada. Yeah. Durr. Um, well, it was a journey to get there. Yeah, but there's was. a very funny part in that movie where he's testing a Ferrari, and he was famous, one of those famous me- mechanic drivers, engineers, mm-hmm. and he says, like, like something. Miles. Yeah, and he says something like, or like a uh, Mark Donahue. Yep. I'm sure there'll be maybe. I'm Actually, sure people that, will be on, on. That would be a good movie, I'm too. I'm sure people will be like optioning a Mark Donahue movie. Yeah. Um, so. Because the book already, too. You could base it on the stories exactly. from um, The Unfair Advantage. So basically. Which is he, a great book if you haven't read it. Yep. Um, it, Nicky Lott is testing this Ferrari in the movie, and he says something about it, like not handling well or being weird or something. The mechanic's like, but it's a Ferrari. And he's just like. I don't care. At least yeah. like, it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, it's shit. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that movie yet. That's the, um, what's his name made that movie, right? I, Oh, Ron Howard. Ron Howard, thank you. Yeah, so it's a it's a good movie, right? You have a good director. I haven't seen that yet. I'll have to see if I can find that one. I don't know if it's streaming anywhere or not yet. Uh, probably. Yeah. All right, so enough about movies. Um, how about things that look like they're from movies? Uh, I'm lost. <laughs> the Tesla Cybertruck oh, gross. looks like it's out of Blade Runner. Uh, I keep seeing memes. Or like... Um, I keep seeing memes with um, the Xbox launch game. Halo. Halo. Yeah, it yeah. looks like that. It looks like it could be out of Blade Runner. Maybe uh, Demolition Man. Back to the Future. Uh, yeah, Back to the Future. Like Could have parked in the in the, clocks, clock, the clock, uh, clock Tower Square there. Um, and I don't know if it's like... My opinion is it was just brilliant marketing to make it look that ridiculous. Yeah. So it's so polarizing that people either love it or hate it. One exists at the moment. Um, Only one. It's not a production car. Because when you look at it. It's got what looks to be a giant metal slab for a dashboard, which will never pass any safety regulations. When you look at the specs, I'm like, yes, that makes sense. Sure. But are they real? Or Or did Elon just be like, what would be impressive 
35,000 pounds towing capacity. Okay, 35,000 pounds towing capacity. 500 miles of range. All right, it goes 500 miles of but range. Those, those, that's not that insane. It is insane because no, it doesn't exist. Not. It doesn't exist. No. None of that exists. No. I, a Tesla can do 300 miles of range. So sure. why, why couldn't the next gen of it do 500? Maybe it can. But at the moment, it can't. The technology is not existent in an existent vehicle yet. It is in this, apparently. Maybe. Nobody's proven it. Nobody said it does. Nobody's tested it. It's not a huge leap. If it was like... I'm, it'll, if but it I'm was, saying if, it's a leap. and Not, not a huge take, leap. But not taking a huge leap is exactly what you would do if you were trying to troll everybody and thinking it was real. If he came out and said, this thing does 10,000 miles on a single charge and can tow down a house and can do 245 miles an hour, he would be like, yeah, bullshit, go away. He comes out here and says... All right, well, our longest range now is 300, and our highest towing capacity now is 15,000 pounds. If I make it 500 and 35,000 pounds, people will believe this, and they'll buy into it, and they'll all give me $100 for deposit. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's real. So I disagree strongly. Um, I don't know. Hopefully it looks – I don't know why you couldn't make it look prettier. I don't care what it looks like because I'm not going to buy one. I hope it looks ugly. To, I hope it looks this ugly. I hope that everybody who buys one – Buys it because they're like, oh, it's the newest Apple product. In this case, Tesla product. It's the same thing. Same same buyers. And they get the thing, and they're all like, yeah, I got this new truck. And then they start driving it, and it sucks, and they hate looking at it every day. But they spent 50 grand on it because they're dumb. It's like so futuristic. It's so polarizing. It's so bad. <laughs> I like the idea that's made of stainless and all the specs. Like, oh, that's that makes another sense. thing. The stainless, in order to be that strong, as they say it is, must be like 17 inches thick. I don't know. What's this truck weigh? 12,000 pounds? It's going to weigh a lot anyways because it has batteries. Okay, so how does it go 500 miles? And how does it have... It's new technology, that, Brad. That's how it does. Technology doesn't exist. It does exist. No, it doesn't exist. It just takes... It's... Unless the Area 51 raid was real. And the only one who went was Elon. And he stole battery technology <laughs> from the aliens <laughs> that are stored there. No, it just takes... It's the way computers advance so quickly. I know. And everything is in multiples. And everything changes. And everything yeah. is... Moves faster as technology goes on, but I don't think this truck can be built to those specs at this moment, especially for that price range. It's not. It's going to come out in 2021, 2023. And if that's true, what you're saying is he is guessing what it will be. No, they're projecting what it it can do. Projecting is another word for guessing. No, not when you're, you know, engineered. You're not just like throwing out random numbers. He did. When you put hundred percent, no. When you put the actual engineering behind it, you can figure out what it does. Sure, they have the tech to do it. Yeah, I don't like the way it looks. I think the Rivian's a much better looking truck. Yeah, and I'd much rather have that because it looks like a functional vehicle. Listen, we had this whole discussion when we talked about the Mach E, the Mach E, the Ford Mach E. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. I don't have a problem with technology. I don't have a problem with electric vehicles. I don't have a problem with other these things happening. I just. I don't think it's good for the electric car industry for Elon to come out here and be like, bam, this is what it's going to be in the future. It doesn't exist yet, but if you want to order one, you exist. can buy it. One exists, and they haven't shown any tests that show these numbers exist. All it is is he sees this up-and-coming company called Rivian coming up with their all-electric truck, and he wants to shut them down before they come and outsell him. That's all. That's all it is. It's all a game. Mm-hmm. It's a big, he's a big internet troll now at this point. It's not going anywhere. No, nah, I think it'll be fine. It won't be fine because it's ugly. Yeah, it's kind of ugly. Yeah, and I know that looks are subjective. And mm, um, listen, all they need looks is are subjective. There's nothing you can argue. I can't argue with somebody that it's ugly or not. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like they could have done a lot to make it look really pretty. Like I can't argue with somebody that's not pretty. Somebody looks at that and they go, "That's pretty." It's like I don't know. There's certain there's certain design. Listen, everything things. everything is acceptable to somebody. I have a girlfriend. You have a wife. Neither one of us should. So yeah. <laughs> everything is subjective to somebody. No, but there's certain there's certain things though. Like there's certain standards of design that you can follow to have mm-hmm. a pretty design. Okay. Um, What's the standard of design for a pickup truck? Uh. You can have like a ninety degree angle between the bed and the cab. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It makes it functional, it, and that's. I think that's one problem I do have with this truck. All joking aside, I'm not really angry about it. It is what it is. It exists. People are going to buy it. Um, but as a truck goes, everybody hates on the Chevy Avalanche. Everybody hates mm. on 
the early Honda Ridge lines. Everybody hates on any truck that doesn't have a super functional bed. And this thing here doesn't you can't hang things over the side of the bed because it has these like giant buttress panels coming down the side of the bed at a weird angle. Yeah, that's what I mean. There's like just certain like design things you should follow. That make a truck a truck. That make a truck a truck. Right. A useful truck. Um, but whatever. If they want to go with that extreme wedge shape, they could have a cap that follows that design language, yeah. not just make the whole thing part of the truck. I, I think that's I think that's going to be a serious sticking point when the truck comes out. Um, if the truck comes out, which it's not going to. Um, but if the truck comes out, I think that will be a serious sticking point to people buying the truck. It. I think you'll see it redesigned again. How is a contractor going to reach over the side of that thing and get their tools out like they do an old pickup truck, you know? Yeah. I think that's going to be the issue. Listen, again, I, I'm i not really that angry about it, but every time I look at it, I do get angrier about it. <laughs> it's like the new electric Porsche. The front of it's so ugly, I can't get past it. Yeah, I don't mind it's it. It's like a dolphin's note. I don't mind it. Dolphins aren't ugly, but you put dolphins nuts on cars and it's ugly. Yeah, it's not a big deal. I'm not going to buy one, so it doesn't matter. We did see a Tesla driving around traffic today, and I was like, that's a good looking car because it was lowered with a wrap and nice wheels. And Yeah. Um, yeah, it was actually the, the YouTuber there. Yeah. Um, Richie B. Kid. Richie B. Knight. Yeah, yeah, but I think he's Richie B. Kid. Rich, Rich Rebuilds. Rich Rebuilds. That's yeah. what it is. YouTube. But Richie B. Kid on Instagram. Yeah, Rich Rebuilds. Um, his, yeah. YouTube is his, his YouTube is his bread and butter, so we'll, we'll pump that. It's Rich Rebuilds. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got like a dark gray dolphin color wrap. Yes. <laughs> it's darker than a dolphin. It's like gunship gray. Which Tesla sedans are, are good looking cars. No, they're definitely good looking cars. There's no question. Yeah. It's a little bit, they're a little strange coming directly at you with no grill, but that's neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't hate them. I don't hate Teslas. I really don't. I don't. I, I I wish the Tesla truck would be a normal looking truck, and I'd be like, yeah, I'd buy one of those. Mm-hmm. You know, if if that price point is real, that's a very competitive price point for a pickup truck. It is fifty grand is a F one fifty nowadays. Yeah. So, but I think uh, you've got Ford and Chevy and probably Dodge are coming down the line with uh, electric pickups and. Because pickup trucks are still the number one selling vehicle in America. Yep, so. by a long shot. Yep. So, quick technology question. Yeah. Do you know for a fact when you go to a Tesla charging station, mm-hmm. do Tesla owners pay for that service? I don't know. Yes. Do they? Mm-hmm. That made me a little bit more like sticking with a gas car. Why? You have to pay for gas. Right, but part of the appeal of a Tesla is, I thought... A money savings on fuel. Yeah, you're not buying gas. Okay, fine, but you're spending twenty dollars, an average of twenty one dollars nationwide to fill up your tank, your electric tank. That's still cheaper than filling my fuel tank. Not by enough to spend an extra twenty grand uh, on the vehicle. Y- yeah, if you add it up, I have to put in. If I'm driving a lot, it's almost forty dollars to put a f- tank of fuel in one of my vehicles. Correct, but now you're talking the difference between buying a. $25,000 uh, Camry or Accord and a sixty to $100,000 Tesla. Oh, then that that person doesn't care about what it costs to put I don't know, I, energy in it. I just had this wild assumption that Tesla superchargers are free. No, they're not. You don't buy a Tesla because you care about fuel mileage. Um, you buy it because you care about... Uh, technology. Technology... You want using to lower the, using the carpool lane. You, yeah, you want to lower your carbon footprint, stuff like that. Use the carpool lane. Have special parking. You want people to pay attention to you. Like, look at this cool thing that I have. It that's not you're not buying it to because it gets. You know, it doesn't. That's that's the only reason I thought that existed. No, no, that's so. you're buying like a Nissan Leaf if you're caring about like saving fuel. Okay, because they're cheap ish mm-hmm. um and they're not they're basically an appliance where uh the tesla is more of a luxury item so well, but how else do you push that technology and get people to buy into an electric car is by you adding nice features and technology to it to get people to buy them who can afford them because they are expensive to begin with mm-hmm. and it eventually trickles down this technology, but you need to get it out into the world for testing. Right. 
people are buying te- uh, brand new Teslas are basically beta testers. You're you're beta testing this technology. Okay. In my opinion. Uh, I I just grumpy old me again, I guess. And once, like we said, now that Ford's getting meanwhile, game, if I had a Tesla, my fuel pump wouldn't be an issue. So no, once get a Tesla. Uh, once, once these cars, you know, the big manufacturers start making cars that compete with it, then they're just going to wipe out Tesla. Tesla's going to wind up going to the wayside yeah. because it's just, yeah. Which yeah. is why Tesla sells a lot of his technology because yeah, he can he can hold the patent and hold now this money is, on all of them in the future. Three episodes in a row that we've talked about electric cars, which is fine. I mean, it's <laughs> honestly the future is there's going to be a lot of electric yeah. cars. It might not be all electric in our lifetime, but there's going to be more and more every year. And you know, this this battle happened before. Mm-hmm. You know, in the, at the turn of the century, when cars were a new thing, there was the turn of the last century when cars were a new thing. There was you know electric versus gasoline, and mm-hmm. people banked on electric because they said there's no infrastructure for gasoline cars. You can't drive across the country and buy gasoline because it doesn't exist. Electricity does. But now it's the opposite argument. You know, it's people saying electric cars aren't going to be the new thing because Mm -hmm. the infrastructure doesn't exist. But it's being built, and the electric infrastructure is already there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we'll see what happens in the future. But it's an exciting time for car technology, and it's going to be something we talk about a lot. Maybe we won't talk about it next week because... Tesla, Elon Musk is not going to uh, troll us with another vehicle release in a little while, I don't think. So, speaking of... We won't talk about Tesla trucks until they either A, exist, or B, get shot into outer space. All right. All right. So, uh, speaking of fun analog cars, I uh, shot some photos of the town the other weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was pretty cool. At a period correct um, cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I did them out in the rain, because I thought it would be kind of cool. It's different, because normally you... Wait for a sunny day and take pictures of golden yeah. hour. So this is more like a take as you can. Mm-hmm. So those are on my Instagram. They look neat. You can uh, find those at Race and Anger. I think I put them. Oh, we did the ten year challenge. We, put we that, did. We put that on the off topic page. Do you know when? How many years I've had that uh, starring for? Ten years. Exactly ten years. Yeah. It was November of '09. Yep. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. I realized that when I was looking for the 10-year-old picture, that it was mm-hmm. November 16th of 09 was the day after we bought it. Realistically, I'm coming up on 20 years of the Talon, but yeah. uh, that's neither here How nor there. How many cars do you have that you have for 10 years? How long have you had the Galant for now? Oh, that's uh, 2011. So. Okay, so it's coming up. Mm-hmm. And obviously, like, Rex, you have nothing else you've had. So yep. I've had my Camaro since I was eight years old, Yeah, technically. So that's 30 years. Mm-hmm. I've had the NSU since 2007, so mm-hmm. that's tw- uh, 12 years. Mm-hmm. I've had the Star the Starian since 09, so that's 10 years, and that must be it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Sapporo is six years. Yep. So, yeah, these guys have all kind of stuck around for a long time. They sure have. I've had a crashed RX-7 that I've never fixed for seven years. <laughs> we didn't even acknowledge it. Actually, this uh, this is the three-year anniversary of this podcast is, this month. Yeah, November of... 2016. 2016. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Three-year challenge, guys. Yep. Uh, hmm. Well, on that note... Yeah, happy three-year anniversary, Andrew. Yeah. Follow us on uh, Facebook. What's, on the, what's the podcast. three-year anniversary gift? I don't know. Uh, it wood. I look it up before my anniversary. <laughs> um, and uh, follow us on Facebook, Auto Off Topic Podcast. Follow us on Instagram, Auto Off Topic. You can follow me again on Instagram at Race to Anger. And Brad, where can they find you? Leather is the. They'll find you on Leather. Yes. That, the only that says no. Leather. Le- <laughs> yeah, no, never mind. Uh, leather is the three year anniversary gift. Okay. So um, I will. We'll. Buy this podcast some new leather seats for our cars. Sure. Um, what were we talking about? Where they can find me? Yeah. TSISS350. All right, cool. So, as always, keep cars analog and aim for the road. <laughs>